A year ago, some of you may remember that we were together at Scent House in London, where Shaf, Sally, and Ele Eleanor brought us together. And it was such fantastic memories, for, for me at least. This year, defeating the COVID, the very same team and supporters have made it possible for us to be together through Zoom. And really, they deserve our warmest and sincerest thanks. Um, the Institute of English Studies, the School of Advanced Studies, the University of London, and particular thanks are due to the Open University UK, Shaf's History of Books and Reading program, and of course, uh, all the members and future members of the IVLS attending tonight. And I thank you, Dustin, for being a guest speaker uh, tonight. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to keep you waiting for Dustin's lecture too long. So I now uh, ask Sally, who is the real maître d'oeuvre, maîtresse d'oeuvre of this lecture. So I ask you, Sally, to introduce our speaker tonight, please. Thank you, Sophie. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dustin Friedman as our speaker this evening for the first online IVLS lecture. Dustin is assistant professor in the Department of Literature at American University in Washington, DC. His research and teaching focuses on Victorian literature and culture with emphasis on aestheticism, decadence, as well as gender and sexuality studies. Dustin's debut monograph, um, before Queer Theory, which is very well thumbed, my copy, um, was published in 2019. And I think it's a really exciting contribution to the study of aesthetics um, and talk, talks about the liberating advantage of queerness. Um, Dustin is currently co-editing uh, the volume Rethinking the 19th Century, the 1890s for Cambridge University with Kristin Mahoney. And his paper is entitled Sinister Exile, Queer Myth and Aesthetic Teleology in Walter Pater and Vernon Lee. Thank you, Justin. Thank you so much, Sally. Uh, and thank you to everyone uh, at the IVLS. Um, it's truly an honor uh, and a privilege to be here today, especially um, on Vernon Lee's birthday. And it's, uh, I'm so thankful that all of you are here. Um, I recognize many of you, some faces are new, or I should say some chat boxes are, are new. Um, but uh, this is quite lovely, and I'm so excited to be able to talk to you today. So uh, I'm going to start with a 1921 essay by Vernon Lee um, titled um, Dionysus in the Eugenian Hills, hence my, my backdrop here, which is the Eugenian Hill in Italy. So in this essay, Vernon Lee memorialized her friend and, and erstwhile mentor, Walter Pater, by reflecting on his short story, Dennis Laksowa. Pater's tale, which tells of the Greek god Dionysus' reappearance in medieval France as a young man named Dennis, was inspired by German author Heinrich Heine's essay, The Gods in Exile, which fancifully proposed that the historical triumph of Christianity forced the Olympians into hiding. Lee herself also made use of this theme in her 1890 fantastic tale, Dionea, which tells of the goddess Venus's return as a child washed up on the shore of a present day uh, Italian village. In Dionysus in the Euganian Hills, Lee ascribes the appeal of the gods in exile for a writer like Pater to their ability to resurrect primitive supernatural feelings in modern individuals. She says of these gods that they partake of the nature of ghosts even more than all gods do, revenants as they are from other ages and with the wistful eeriness of all ghosts. They give the impression of what she calls an in and out existence of alternate mysterious appearance and disappearance that is therefore a kind of haunting. Out of the pantheon, she says that Dionysus is the one fittest 
for such sinister exile. Because in the modern Western world, he has grown to be the symbol of moods which seek deliverance from reality and horror, as well as excessive rapture. What Nietzsche has taught us to distinguish as the Dionysiac, as opposed to the Apolline side of art. As the wine god of the vine, he symbolizes the aesthetic pleasures of lost self-control and socially forbidden desires. What Lee calls hopes and fancies, the ecstasies and barbarities which humdrum existence has said no to. She draws an Orientalist imagery to link Dionysus' sexual dissidence to his racial difference. Describing this god, traditionally considered to be of Asiatic origin, in her words, as a seducer of women, but little more than a woman himself. His effeminacy is like those beautiful languid Arabs who strike one as women in disguise, the beard against their jasmine cheeks seeming some kind of ritual half mask. My talk today will explore how both Pater's and Lee's writings on myth present the supernatural as primarily an aesthetic phenomenon that gives modern readers access to embodied experiences and modes of being that have otherwise been foreclosed by rationalistic modernity. By doing so, I argue, they interrogate how the rationalism of post-enlightenment aesthetics has worked hegemonically to exclude sexual, gender, and racial others from the promises of liberal humanist culture. While critics have long noted that bringing hidden erotic desires to light is a recurring theme for both authors, their mythological writings in particular raise the question of what the long-term consequences of these unearthings might be. Are they but a momentary rupture of humdrum existence? as we write of Dionysus? Or might they inspire a more lasting and substantial cultural transformation? Furthermore, to what extent do Pater's and Lee's questioning of the aesthetic practices that uphold gender and sexual norms also lead them to question the aesthetic's role in producing and reproducing Victorian assumptions about race? I am proposing that Pater and Lee shared the belief that art could create lasting social transformation for queers and other marginalized subjects by undermining the process by which post-enlightenment aesthetics universalized liberal ideology. Liberalism, uh, and this is being used as a shorthand, and I'm borrowing this phrase from the historian James Vernon, uh, a set of ideas in economics and politics and a technique of government united in the commitment to maximizing the freedom of certain individuals who supposedly embody the ideals of rationality and self-possession uh, which is necessarily premised on strategic forms of segregation and suppression of those who appear not to embody these spurious abstractions by virtue of their gender, race, social class, and or sexuality, and this is Vernon. Okay. So according to Candace Chu, in her recent book, The Difference Aesthetics Makes, the primary way liberal culture attempts to resolve this tension between the universal and the particular, i.e. the fact that these supposedly universal ideals are preeminently embodied by white heterosexual cisgender men is through aesthetic teleology, which she describes as one of the defining concepts of Kantian and post-Kantian aesthetics. Aesthetic teleology is the notion that once an individual has achieved the ability to judge rightly of what is beautiful through a process of aesthetic education, that that individual is now attuned to all that and only that which can be truly shared among all humankind, i.e. that one's particular vision of the world is now fully aligned with and indistinguishable from what is universal and rational. For Chu, aesthetic teleology is one of the methods that liberal culture uses to rationalize the persistence of white supremacist heteropatriarchy within a society that nominally promises universal equality. It does so by casting the aesthetic experiences of those others as ineluctably particular, and thus testifying to the fact that they have not yet gained the capacity for reason that would qualify them for participation in liberal self-governance. Yet for Pater and Lee, this also made the aesthetic the preeminent venue for interrogating and reimagining the conditions governing the relationship between the particular and the universal, and thus for substantively altering the logic by which the dominant liberal order includes and excludes particular kinds of embodied experience from the shared common sense of humanity. They accomplish these goals by exploring the survival of an ostensibly pre-modern and primitive phenomenon, namely the supernaturalism they associated with the myth of Dionysus. They do so in order to reject the tendency toward teleological thinking that dominates post-enlightenment aesthetics 
and along with it, exclusionary liberal humanist renderings of human subjectivity. They instead demonstrate that the primitivism of Dionysian experience is actually inclusively universal. Its supernatural ecstasies and barbarities affirms the universal aesthetic and ethical value of those unbeautiful and distasteful, quote unquote, modern experience, embodied experiences. So in other words, rapture, irrationality, subjectlessness, the loss of self-control. These things that the dominant culture associated with sexual, gender, and racial others, and which appeared to mark them as hopelessly mired in the particular, unable to attain the heights of universal reason. Pater and Lee show that the uh, Dionysian experience, uh, that the Dionysian encompasses both pre-modern and modern modes of experience that persist across racial, gender, and sexual categories. While by contrast, the ostensible universalism of beauty is particular to Western liberal culture. This is not to claim that Pater and Lee were exceptionally or even consistently anti-racist writers, or even that they fully grasped the structural racism embedded in their culture. What I am instead suggesting is that through their investigations of the aesthetics of supernaturalism, they realized the impossibility of separating Victorian culture's gender and sexual exclusion from its practices of racial exclusion. Pater and Lee created queer Dionysian myths in their writings to reject the disciplinary force of aesthetic teleology and open a space for the artistic imagining of forms of human subjectivity that exist beyond the restrictive limits of so-called liberal universality. So one of the primary venues where Pater accomplished this was in his mythological essay, A Study of Dionysus, The Spiritual Form of Fire and Dew, which was published in the Fortnightly Review in 1876. As Stefano Evangelista has noted, this essay directly challenges the 19th century's dominant Apollonian version of aesthetics, notably articulated by John Ruskin. Pater's essay explicitly relies on Ruskin's historical theory of myths from the 1861 study, The Queen of the Air. He rejects, however, what I'm about to characterize as Ruskin's Kantian emphasis on the teleological achievement of liberal ideas of rationality and individualistic self-possession and the racist implications of such ideals. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is give a very brief reading of Ruskin's uh, theory of myths historical development and how it derives from a racialized interpretation of Kant's aesthetic before moving on to explain how Pater and then Lee are resisting Ruskin's interpretation through their writings on myth and Dionysus. Okay. So Kant writes in the Critique of Judgment that deliverance from superstition is called enlightenment for the blindness in which superstition places us, which it even imposes upon us as an obligation, makes the need of being guided by others and the consequent passive state of our reason particularly noticeable. And that's Kant, okay? So mythopoetic thinking undermines the capacities for rational self-control that make for properly enlightened liberal citizen subjects. This assumption also underlies Ruskin's stadial theory of myth, which makes explicit the underlying racial logic of Kant's Enlightenment aesthetics. Ruskin claims that myths continue to be relevant in the post-Enlightenment age, despite having their origin in the unscientifically naive and superstitious early stages of human development, because they eventually develop into parables with universal, which is to say rational, significance to all humankind. In typical of paradoxical liberal fashion, Ruskin attributes this ability to reach the universal through myth only to particular cultures and races. Great myths, he says, are myths made by great people. And now this is the first quote on the handout that uh, should have come around in the chat. So Ruskin says, the myth of a simple and ignorant race must necessarily mean little because a simple and ignorant race have little to mean. And the real meaning of any myth is that which it has at the noblest age of the nation among whom it is current. The farther back you pierce, the less significance you will find until you come to the first narrow thought which indeed contains the germ of the accomplished tradition, but only as the seed contains the flower. As the intelligence and passion of the race develop, they cling to and nourish their beloved and sacred legend. Leaf by leaf it expands under the touch of more pure affections and more delicate imagination until at last the perfect fable burgeons out into symmetry of milky stem and honeyed 
bell. Okay. So for Ruskin, while all myths have their origins in particular experiences, what he calls the first narrow thought, they only attain universal significance when they exist within and progress alongside the intelligence and passion of the race that is superior to other races, where they eventually attain the delicate, um, and it must be said somewhat queasily phallic beauty of the milky stem and honeyed bell. That is the aesthetic equivalent of the rational truths they contain. By contrast, a simple and ignorant race, or what he called elsewhere in the queen of the air, a childish race, will remain mired in a particularity that has no significance to others because they are unable to transcend that first narrow thought. So Ruskin's comments here rehearse the teleology of post-Enlightenment liberal aesthetics and make explicit its underlying racial logic. Enlightenment thinkers like Kant propose that while every human being throughout history has an embodied response to objects in the world, these responses can be educated over time into a more finely attuned appreciation of what is truly beautiful. This appreciation is a worthy goal because, uh, as Kant says in the Critique of Judgment, it is the object of an entirely disinterested satisfaction or dissatisfaction. So the pleasure one receives from a properly aesthetic appreciation of a beautiful object does not arise from its ability to satisfy one's merely personal needs and desires, but truly for its own sake alone. It provides, Kant says, a universal satisfaction. The individual's achievement of an aesthetic appreciation for beauty thus testifies to the fact that his particular subjective experiences have transcended the merely personal and are now aligned with what is rational, that is, what is truly universal, insofar as it can be shared by and communicated among all other human beings, the Kantian sense is communist or common sense. By being subjectively aligned to that which compels universal assent, the individual is now worthy of fully participating in and receiving the bounties of liberal culture and society. When an entire race achieves this ability, as Ruskin states, this signifies their greatness and superiority over simple and ignorant races. The problem with this kind of proposition, Candace Chu explains, is not only that beauty is itself an essentially empty notion that can be stretched to include whatever the dominant social group happens to value and include whatever it doesn't, but also that liberal culture understands the ability to perceive beauty as the telos of human development. When someone outside the dominant group has an aesthetic experience, it is by definition unbeautiful and thus testifies to their primitiveness, backwardness, and inadequately developed humanity. Whatever aesthetic experience they have is held to be only personal and idiosyncratic and thus marks the incommensurability between their intellectively particular subjectivity and the universal rational principles that are the prerequisite of participating in liberal self-governance. In other words, the aesthetic experiences of these racial, gender, and sexual others indicate that they must remain in what Depeche Chakrabarty calls liberalism's waiting room of history, because they have not yet attained the proper level of cultivation that is putatively available to anyone who has worked to achieve the requisite level of taste and hence reason. In actuality, of course, they never will be. The very fact that it is they who have these aesthetic experiences means that those experiences are definitionally disqualified from universality. The aesthetic teleology of beauty authorizes this disqualification by making the inferiority of these unbeautiful experiences of non dominant groups appear to be a subjectively universal truth. For Ruskin, the historical triumph of universal reason attained by superior races over the irrationality of the primitive races is figured by the god Apollo, of whom he says uh, he represents the kindling, purifying, and illuminating intellectual wisdom that is the purging of evil vision and fear. In Greek myth, the music of Apollo's lyre uh, triumphs in a contest against the pipe playing of Marsyas whom Evangelista notes is for Ruskin a Dionysian persona. This signifies, and here I'm quoting from Evangelista, the victory of the music in which words and thoughts lead over the one in which the wind or impulse leads, the triumph of the Apollonian intellectual over the Dionysian, brutal or meaningless in art. Ruskin's rendering of Apollo indicates that for him as much as for Kant, aesthetic beauty and intellectual rationality mutually reinforce each other, as both testify to the greatness of a race whose myths speak universal truths, as opposed to the what he calls the narrow, childish meaninglessness 
and brutal creations of more primitive races represented mythologically by Marseille. Okay. Pater, by contrast, instead demonstrates in his essay, A Study of Dionysus, that the experience of Dionysian supernaturalism, which Ruskin associated with the particularities of racial others, is in reality just as universal as Apollonian rationalism. Pater's essay refers explicitly to the same stages of myth's development that Ruskin identifies, but he moves away from Ruskin's racialized historical and aesthetic teleology. Pater instead focuses on how the Dionysian supernaturalism that great myths and races supposedly leave behind are not actually brutal and meaningless, but instead can themselves attain the universality that Ruskin associated with the Apollonian rationality that only certain racial groups can achieve. Pater adopts Ruskin's historical theory of myth's development, but demonstrates that its phases overlap with each other in complex ways. He conceives of the history of myth in non-teleological and ultimately aesthetic terms as what he calls a struggle, a streben, quoting uh, the German, within Greek art, between the palpable and limited human form and what he calls the floating essence it is to contain, the free spirit of air and light and sky. While Ruskin believed that the move from vague projections of human agency onto nature to concrete personification through the figures of the gods indicates myth's progress on the way to full rationalization, Pater instead understands Greek art to be defined by the continued dialectical struggle to do justice to those free floating psychological impressions within representations that are necessarily limited by aesthetic form, which is what he means by the strepin. Okay? This admixture, which undermines the binary opposition between the primitive and the modern, is especially apparent in the, the figure of Dionysus, who Pater explains came later than the other gods to the centers of Greek life. And as a consequence of this, he is presented to us in an earlier stage of development than they. For Pater, he represents the world of vision unchecked by positive knowledge and in which the myth is begotten among a primitive people as they wandered over the life of the thing their hands helped forward till it became to them a kind of spirit. Pater associates this primitiveness with a universal ethical sensibility and sensitivity that writers like Ruskin more typically associated with the ostensible refinement of Apollonian beauty. And this is the second quote on your handout. The religion of Dionysus is, Pater asserts, one of many modes of that primitive tree worship, which growing out of some universal instinctive belief that trees and flowers are indeed habitations of living spirits is found almost everywhere in the earlier stages of civilization. Such feeling may still float about a mind full of modern light. The feeling we too have of a life in the green world, always ready to assert its claim over our sympathetic fancy. Who has not at moments felt the scruple, which is with us always regarding animal life, following the signs of animation further still, till one almost hesitates to pluck out the little soul of flower or leaf. The universal instinctive belief Pater identifies here reaches out across histories and cultures. It still persists in our minds full of modern life, full of modern lights, just as it did everywhere in earlier stages of civilization, regardless of any geographical or racial differences. What Kant would perceive as a loss of rational self-control Pater instead presents as a sympathetic fancy, one that testifies to our connections to all other human beings, regardless of time or place, and even hints that we too may share a common life in common with the green world. This sympathy inspires us to care for the environment and its inhabitants, rather than to enact the rationalist mastery over nature implied by Kant's comment on reason's triumph over the supernatural. Instead of being the kind of narrow thought that for Ruskin bespeaks the uncommunicability and merely particular impressions of undeveloped peoples, the figure of Dionysus for Pater represents a primitive and irrational impulse that nevertheless still elicits in us the indifferent judgment of value that for Kant belongs exclusively to the aesthetic experience of beauty. One that we experience as an inherent quality of the object itself that we feel should compel universal assent. 
we refrain to pluck out the little soul of flower or leaf entirely for its own sake, not because it fulfills any of our appetites or desires, and also not because its form alone gives us pleasure, as uh, in the case in Kant's description is beautiful. Gantish Chu explains that the increasing preoccupation of aesthetic philosophy with beauty subsequent to the Western European 18th century and the naturalization of attendant forms of subjectivity and governance to speak and attempt to regulate the direction of aesthetic subjectivization. So that is to say, developing a proper taste for beauty through aesthetic education is an attempt to discipline and normalize the development of one's personhood. By contrast, a version of aesthetic disinterestedness of the kind described by Pater in this passage, one that is divorced from the emphasis on beauty and hence also from the teleology of aesthetic education, is instead what Chu calls a beneficial state of suspension between the subject and object, wherein predictability and intentionality are arrested. Neither the subject nor object is perfectly delineated or coherent in this encounter. It is in effect a state of subjectlessness. Thus, although development in the enlightened liberal citizen subject is the trajectory imposed by modernity through the concept of beauty, such subjectivization is neither inevitable nor an opposite account of humanity. This new version of subjectivity would, in other words, be non-teleological. So if we begin recognizing, as Peter does here, that other kinds of embodied aesthetic experience can be uh, undergone indifferently and hence be shared universally and communicated with others, we can also begin imagining new ways of aligning the particular and the universal and create a more apposite version of human subjectivity beyond the exclusions of liberal humanism. The concept of the universal is thus not itself a problem. It only becomes a problem when it is an excuse for not acknowledging that certain human experiences are in fact universal. That is, when the particular worldview of a particular social group falsely presents itself as universal as it does in modern liberal humanist ideology. So uh, Dennis Denisoff, who I believe I saw him here today, uh, Dennis Denisoff has argued that in a study of Dionysus, Pater's contrast between uh, what he calls Apollonian self-conscious intelligence, that is rational mental thought, with the Dionysian instinctual sense of being that is not characterized by humanist notion of self, represents the sacrifice of liberal humanism itself. I would qualify that statement by suggesting that Pater is instead seeking to define a more truly universal humanism that exceeds the limitations and exclusions of liberalism. He describes aesthetic experiences that are universally shared and communicable among all human beings, but do not rely on the individual will to dominate self, other, and nature, which is inherent to instrumental liberal rationalism. A humanism, in other words, that can recognize the shared life of the green world rather than defining itself in opposition to it. Pater presents Dionysus as the figure for a new version of the aesthetic that, as Evangelista states, is entirely independent from Ruskin's celebration of Apollonian beauty. Pater writes that for the ancient Greeks, Dionysus uh, fills the place of Apollo. He's the inherent cause of music and poetry and suggests that in the modern era, the imitative arts would draw from it altogether new motives of freedom and energy, a freshness in old form. This is because for Pater Dionysus inspires. He explains the phenomena of enthusiasm as distinguished by Plato in the Phaedrus. The secrets of possession by a higher and more energetic spirit than one's own. The gift of self-revelation, of passing out of oneself through words, tones, gestures. Dionysus demonstrates, in other words, that there is aesthetic and ethical value in the loss of independent self-direction, in the experience of the enthusiastic gift of possession and the subjectless passing out of oneself that is elicited by aesthetic experiences when they are divorced from beauty's disciplinary force. This is why for Pater, a Dionysian version of the aesthetic actually testifies to the universality of the irrational embodied experiences of those whom the dominant culture assumes to be ineluctably particular. Vernon Lee, even more than Pater, emphasizes in her writings the violence that beauty, at least as it, as it is defined by post-enlightenment aesthetics, does to supernatural rationalism and those whom the dominant culture associates with it, as well as how aesthetic teleology works to include the aesthetic and literal violence against women and racial others that it authorizes. <clears throat> 
as she shows in her short story, Dionia, which I will be discussing in a few moments. In her major critical account of supernatural aesthetics, the essay Faustus and Helena notes on the supernatural in art, she echoes, and I think might have drawn directly from, Pater's discussion of uh, Dionysian mythology. Like Pater, she explicitly name checks the teleological theory of myth found in Ruskin's The Queen of the Air in her discussion of how uh, the, and these are her words, the necessarily essentially vague supernatural lies beyond and outside the limits of the possible, the rational, the explicable, uh, and also rejects Ruskin's uh, stadial rationalist progressive teleology in her celebration of what she calls pagan myths continued vitality. Yet Lee emphasizes the violence of the historical movement away from supernatural vagueness and toward Apollonian formalism as modern aesthetics and modern rationalism reinforce each other by aggressively excluding particular kinds of experiences from their ostensibly universalist purview. She says that the advent of aesthetic practices that focus on formal perfection rudely seized and disentangled and rudely severed from the inchoate experiences of early humanity's supernaturalism, resulting in the destruction of their inherent power. Ultimately, she says, when art reaches maturity and independence, it goes beyond restricting impressions and fancies within the limits of form and begins restricting them yet closer within the limits of beauty. Even more explicitly and emphatically than Pater, we understand that modernity's installation of beauty as the highest aesthetic ideal goes hand in hand with its teleological installation of rationality as its highest intellectual ideal. The synthetical definiteness of formal art, she says, is as skeptical as the analytical definiteness of logic and has the effect of casting out the supernatural experiences that are actually shared by all of humanity from the realm of universality by denigrating them as unrefined and merely primitive. Lee also understands how the violent teleology of aesthetic beauty is both shaped by and perpetuates the violence of racism. In her 1887 essay, The Lake of Charlemagne, An Apology of Association, she discusses whether we should allow our aesthetic judgments to be colored by the personal associations an object recalls for us, or whether they should be restricted solely to the impression made by an object's formal qualities. The main illustration she gives of associationism is a steamboat trip she took through a Rhine River landscape that modern artists had deemed outmoded, and which she also found completely unmoving until she remembered the stories of the Rhineland, which were told to her by what she called a buxom, romantic, poetic childhood maid. Catherine Ann Wiley interprets this as a recollection of lesbian desire that pits the particularity of erotic memory against hegemonic expectations and affirms the relevance of an individual's non-rational embodied sensations to their aesthetic experiences. For Wiley, Lee asserts the freedom of our, to be our own ever-changing selves as defined against the aesthetic principles of our historically bound society. I argue that Lee also explores the implications of this insight for explaining how the aesthetic shapes our individual impressions via the ostensible common sense or the Kantian sense as communists created by the disinterested aesthetic appreciation of beauty, such that prejudicial racial assumptions come to seem like objective, universally shared and rational truth. And here's the second quote on your handout. Lee writes, were we to seek the reasons why a strong and healthy human body of our race gives us a general sense of beauty, which we would, should not receive from a deformed Negro, we should find that the single elements of lines, curves, and tints were probably not, in the one case, more agreeable to our nerves of sight than in the other case. We should probably discover that the selfsame lines, curves, and tints were contained in a great number of objects of which we should call some ugly and some beautiful, and that we must consequently seek the explanation of the sense of beauty connected with the one figure and of ugliness connected with the other in the suspicious loathing with which savages of a slightly superior race look upon other savages of a slightly inferior race, their slaves or enemies. The original motive of preference has been obliterated by centuries. So despite her subtle attempts to minimize the disparity between the races, Lee is here undoubtedly expressing uh, a racist belief in black inferiority 
and assumes all of her readers and the universal aesthetic subject itself to be white. Yet with that being said, she also highlights how the historical development of the concept of formal beauty perpetuates racist beliefs by making them appear to be objective truths. At a particular historical juncture long ago, white people made a subjective judgment particular to their own group that black people were inferior. Over time, as whites begin to associate not just personal or group preferences, but formal beauty itself to white bodies and formal ugliness to black bodies, the subjective universality of aesthetic judgment makes it appear that these qualities are inherent to the formal properties of the object itself, what Lee calls its lines, curves, and tints, and should be shared by everyone with properly developed taste. When the group that holds this aesthetic judgment is in a position of cultural power, beauty becomes a way of making that dominance appear to be rational and a natural matter of course, rather than the contingent outcome of political struggle. In this way, culturally dominant definitions of beauty are not just determined by cultural hegemony, but actively help to perpetuate it. For Lee, the supernatural, ex uh, the, for Lee, the supernatural is a universal experience that, unlike the sense of beauty developed through aesthetic education, is deeply subjective, yet truly shared by everyone precisely because it is primitive, and thus does not seek to exclude anything or anyone from its purview. In the short story, Dionea, supernaturalism reveals that it is merely the cultural dominance of white heteropatriarchal culture that makes it appear as if its particular definition of aesthetic beauty is the only way of mediating between the particular and the universal. She does this by having her main character, the love goddess Venus, return to a present day Italian village, destroy the white man who attempts to sculpt her, a German artist named Valdemar, who represents the rationalism as well as the racism and misogyny within the Apollonian ideal of beauty. Lee's epistolary tale is told through a series of letters written by Dr. Alessandro de Rotis to his patron, Lady Evelyn Savelli. The story begins in 1873, when de Rotis tells of the discovery of a young girl named Dionia, who washes up on the shores of the fictional village of Montemurcha. Over the years, de Rossi's narrates Dionia's childhood raised by nuns and her eventual growth into the village sorceress as a young woman, as well as his own ultimately failed attempt to write a history of the fall of the pagan gods inspired what he calls my friend Heine's little book. Over the course of the story, Dionia causes the deaths of a series of men who have sexually menaced her, culminating in the destruction of Valdemar, who kills himself and his wife in a quasi-pagan sacrificial rite after which Dionia disappears to the sea and, and that's the end of the story. So Dionia's name clearly references Dione, the mother of Aphrodite in Greek myth, but also recalls the name Dionysus. As a supernatural outsider, her status as a god in exile in a rationalistic modern world intertwines with her status as a cultural, racial, and sexual outsider to the dominant culture on Montemurto. When she is first discovered, Derosis calls her a poor little brown mite who understood no kind of Italian and jabbered some kind of half intelligible Eastern jabber, uh, recall, recalling the Oriental origins of Dionysus. Although she eventually learns Italian, Derosis renders her all but inarticulate in the story that bears her name. He records her direct speech on only three occasions, each time in relation to one of the men who dies. Uh, and more frequently finds her, uh, quote, uttering strange cooing sounds, letting out long drawn guttural vowels, using a high guttural voice in a strange chant and singing words in an unknown tongue. He remarks on her threateningly exotic uh, appearance as someone who is rather out of place, an amazing little beauty, dark, lithe, with an odd ferocious gleam in her eye and later calls her immaculate and savage, anticipating Joseph Conrad's description of Kurtz's savage and superb black mistress in Heart of Darkness nine years later. The opacity attached to Dionysia's linguistic, cultural, and racial otherness disqualifies her from participating in the village's sexual economy. Although she is dubbed La Bello Dionysia by the inhabitants of Montemurto, De Rossi explains that none of the boys, peasants or fishermen, seem to hang on her steps. And if they turn round to stare and whisper as she goes by, 
It is, I remark, with an expression rather of fear than of love. Despite the fear she evokes, Valdemar the sculptor quickly becomes enchanted by Dionysia's otherness, despite his classically influenced misogyny. When Derossi first introduces him as a visitor to Montemurto from Northern Europe, he remarks that Valdemar's statues are only of men and boys, athletes and fauns. When he later asks Valdemar why he only sculpts male figures, Valdemar replies, the female figure is almost inevitably inferior in strength and beauty. Woman is not form. The point of a woman is not her body, but in here his eyes rested very tenderly upon the thin white profile of his wife, her soul. Lee clearly intends Valdemar to represent the sexism underlying the Apollonian ideal of beauty articulated most famously and influentially by the German art historian Johann Joachim Winkelmann, who is also the subject of an admiring essay by Pater in Studies in the History of the Renaissance. Winkelmann, in his book, The History of the Art of Antiquity, celebrates ancient Greek sculpture and especially the statue of the Apollo Belvedere as the highest ideal of art among the works of antiquity that have escaped its destruction. The self-containment, impenetrability, and pride of which contrasts with that of Dionysus of whom Winkleman says, uh, signals availability and invites profanation. Pater's essay uh, on Winkleman uh, includes a translation from one of his letters where he asserts that those who are observant of beauty only in women and are moved little or not at all by the beauty of men seldom have an impartial, vital, inborn instinct for beauty in art. To such persons, the beauty of Greek art will ever seem wanting because its supreme beauty is rather male than female. So while the homoerotic overtones of such statements are clear, in Dionysia, Lee instead focuses on how the equation between beauty, rationality, and masculinity found in Winkelmann's Apollonian ideal, which was also a key influence for Kant's description of beauty in the critique of judgment, justifies violent misogyny and racism within the culture more generally by providing a rationale for the objectification of female and non-white bodies. When Gertrude, Valdemar's notably white wife, insists that he finally attempt to create a statue of a woman, she goes out scanning the girls of our village with the eyes of a slave dealer before settling on the dark brown and eastern Dionysia. When Dionysia poses nude for Valdemar, Derossi briefly considers the moral implications before asking rhetorically whether a village girl, an obscure and useless life within the bounds of what we choose to call right and wrong, can be weighed against the possession by mankind of a great work of art, a Venus immortally beautiful. Valdemar, Gertrude, and Derossi's all believe that Apollonian aesthetic beauty supersedes quotidian moral considerations of what is, of right and wrong, especially when it comes to someone of an inferior social status, because what beautiful art offers to all mankind justifies the exploitation of the structurally powerless by the culturally powerful. The only way her obscure, useless life can be rendered beautiful is if it is translated into an object of universally recognized value, a great work of art. Dionysia's supernaturalism, however, has its revenge on all of them. While Valdemar at first dismisses his wife's request by quoting Schopenhauer's remark that women are the unesthetic sex, Dionysia proves this to be true, but not in the sense he intended. Her feminine supernaturalism comes to defeat humiliate and defeat Valdemar's aesthetic formalism. Derossi says that Valdemar regards Dionysia as utterly as a mere inanimate thing, a form to copy, a body scarcely considered as human. Even after spending hours of the most rapt contemplation of her, the way in which he speaks to Dionysia is almost brutal in its coldness. And yet to hear him exclaim, how beautiful she is. Good God, how beautiful. No love of mere woman was ever so violent as this love of woman's mere shape. Her fluctuating vagueness continually eludes his violent, objectifying attempts to capture it within the definite aesthetic form of an Apollonian sculpture, thereby demonstrating that its vaunted universality does in fact have its limits. Her resistance to being artistically represented by Valdemar brings out the latent ferocity of the wild animal in him which eventually results in the murder-suicide of himself and his wife when he sacrifices uh, her in front of a pagan altar he is built for the worship 
of Venus slash Dionea in his studio, which he then sets on fire. The metaphorical violence that aesthetic formalism does to the vague impressions of the supernatural, described by Lee in her Faustus and Helena essay, has now been literalized by the violence Voldemort performed on Gertrude and on himself. As the very embodiment of white male Apollonianism, his worship of and sacrifice to Dionea's forces, sacrifice to Dionea forces his superior reason to be humiliated and sacrificed to her power. Yet Dionea has not directly done violence to him. Instead, Voldemort's rationality has literally self-immolated as a result of his inability to capture her flickering supernaturalism within the ostensibly universal Apollonian ideal of beauty. Dionea humiliates Voldemort just as Kant says the supernatural humiliates reason by, in his words, making the need of being guided by others and the consequent passive state of our reason particularly noticeable. The story ends when Derosis informs Lady Evelyn that Dionea has been spotted sailing away on a Greek boat, to speaking the continued survival of her pagan supernaturalism, even in an ostensibly disenchanted modern world. While a teleological aesthetic insists that all traces of supernaturalism must be purged from reason, Lee's story shows that an artistic practice that forcefully excludes all that which does not fall under its limited definition of beauty will eventually be consumed by the same violence it perpetuates upon others. In a recent critique of Victorian studies as an academic discipline, Ranjani Chatterjee, Alicia Mireles Christoph, and Amy R. Wrong have called attention to the field foundation in whiteness, universalism, and liberalism that were themselves products of the Victorian era and the urgent need to make room for a new epistemological model that unmakes false universals and imagines new humanism in their place. Today, I am suggesting that this also describes the project Peter and Lee undertook in their queer mythological writing on Dionysus. By turning to the aesthetic in an attempt to gain critical distance from their own liberal culture, they assess the limitations and exclusions of a dominant Apollonian paradigm and attempted to imagine a version of the human that might lie beyond it. This is not to suggest that either of them had a fully worked out understanding of the racial politics of Victorian culture. What I'm suggesting rather is that their questioning of the aesthetic's role in universalizing the gender and sexual norms of liberal Victorian culture led them almost inevitably to have to reckon with the racial exclusions that were also part of this hegemony. Queer Victorian essays were on the whole neither particularly nor consistently anti-racist. Their writings frequently bound up in the discourse of exoticizing Orientalism. Yet Pater's and Lee's writings on the Dionysus myth show us that queer Victorian projects invested in creating lateral, lasting cultural transformation could not and indeed still cannot proceed without attending to the intersections among race, gender, and sexuality in their bids to imagine new and more inclusive humanisms beyond the limits of the 19th century's liberal imagination. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal. Thank you. And it was you. great Thank that you, you uh, managed to bring in the, the Stabilize in the 19th Century essay. I'm just going to switch my camera on, if I can. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Just admit someone who has been waiting. Would anybody um, like to start off with questions? I'm just checking that I can see where everybody is. Are you all back on gallery view? Oh. I know it's always a little nerve wracking to have to be the first one to. <laughs> I'm just uh, on Zoom. Sorry, there's a problem with being a chair and a host at the same time. I, I really felt kind of the the sense of, um, I don't know, like almost like a self-determination mm -hmm. 
is evident in in your reading, like Lee's mm -hmm. own self determination and agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you feel about the recent Reclaim Her Name campaign? Have you seen? I have seen that, yes. Um, I, I have questions about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly. Um, yes, I, 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 for, for Vernon Lee, at least, I've always gotten the impression that Vernon Lee was a persona that uh, she very deliberately crafted and inhabited and lived. Um, and, and I do feel that this the Reclaim Her Name project is um, sort of against the spirit in which Vernon Lee um, presented herself to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any questions? Um, Beth has asked about the handout. The handout was on the email and it's just in the, uh, if you scroll back on the chat, mm -hmm. it's there. Hi. Yes. Hi, Anna. Hi. 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 Um, can I ask a question or, or more a comment? Please. Um, uh, uh, maybe just to start this off, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for this uh, superb talk. Thank and I, I, I really want to read it and uh, reread it. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about, about the, uh, the uni universalism that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about Peyton, I'm thinking about the Renaissance. And you know, at the very beginning, when, when he's talking about uh, effectively, uh, the the kind of the method of ad work that he's proposing, which is all about impressionism and mm. and and how really impressionism allows the individual to experience art in a kind of a very personal uh, way. Mm. And I was just mm -hmm. trying to to uh, just trying to think of that in the context of your talk. And I was just thinking, mm. surely that kind of form of thinking about art, which is uh, the impressionistic method. Mm -hmm. is, is, is a form of freedom uh, away mm -hmm. from liberal humanism. And, mm -hmm. and I was just thinking how, how you link that to the universal uh, in, mm -hmm. in Peter that you're describing. Is, yeah, is that... something which I think, sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. That was, that was really it. Okay, uh, no, that's a great question. So something that I think is, is really interesting that I'm trying to draw out of Peter is precisely how his aesthetic impressionism in some ways is um, a challenge to uh, more traditional notions of how we think of aesthetic education, right? Because instead of it being the sort of thing where like, okay, you have to, you have to learn beauty, right? right? He says that you have to realize beauty for, for yourself or, or not at all, right? You have to pay attention to your own impressions, right? And what I think you might be getting at is, um, at least this is my theory, I have to think it through a bit more, is that by paying attention to your own aesthetic impressions, that that can maybe lead you back to another universalism, right? Not a universalism, which is the universalism of learning culturally normative ideals of beauty, but a sort of universal aesthetic impressionism, which often sometimes gets dismissed as like mere primitivism, right? This idea that like you're just you're kind of instinctual feeling. Yeah, thank you. We have a question in the chat from Emma Barker. Emma, do you want to unmute or? Okay, I, I was, uh, I was just wondering as you spoke about the dangers of associating other races with the primitive and that that can have you know a problematic side to it and then I think you dealt with that by saying mm -hmm. there was an element of orientalism um, mm -hmm. which was sort of very much what I was wondering about so obviously you had you know you were obviously aware of this but I wondered if you could expand on this and that the, sure, the danger yeah. of challenging the Apollonian in terms of its limits is that you can land up 
endorsing a kind of prejudice against the other, even while in the most with the most generous of in, of intentions. And while I'm talking, I might also say I got a bit puzzled with, you know, that Valdemar thinks that the female is unrepresented, isn't worthy of art. And then it's almost as if Dianea confirms it by by resisting representation. That's an aside, but I think it's connected. Thanks. Right. Um, right. No, that's a great. That's great. Thank you. So the way I'm thinking of it is that um, what I think is actually happening here is that Pater and Lee are actually trying to just think beyond this like primitive and advanced dichotomy, and to say that actually what often gets uh, what is often called primitive, right, is, is nothing of the sort, or, or it doesn't have any of the negative connotations which modernity attaches to it, but um, is in fact uh, in many ways superior aesthetically and ethically uh, to, to what is what is just to um, to the, sort of the Apollonian, right, um, and trying to say that they're actually not as in indistinguishable. So in that sense, with Dionia, right. It's not as if like she is unrepresentable altogether. In fact, she's represented in the story itself, right? Through Lee's own methods of composition, which are not the Apollonian, the Apollonian classicism, male kind of homoerotic misogyny of, of Valdemar, right? So how I'm trying to think about it is in terms of rather than like associating rather than sort of assenting to the association of racial others with primitivism, they're in fact trying to critique how modern aesthetic culture does that. We have a question from Patricia. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dustin. Thank you very Hi. much for a wonderful talk. Really enjoyed Thank that. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether you could say a little bit more about, because I, I think I'm interested in this idea sort of like the the misogyny um, mm -hmm. that's in, inherent in this kind of Apollonian um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of aesthetic. And, um, and I wondered if you could say whether you see that in, um, in, in Vernon Lee's, outside of Vernon Lee's supernatural fiction, because I can see how mm -hmm. that works in supernatural fiction, but in terms of her own, mm -hmm. her own writing on aesthetics, whether you detect that tension there as well. Mm -hmm. I, I see something very similar with the way that um, uh, Helen of Troy is discussed in the Faustus and Helena essay. Um, and here I'm, I'm sort of repeating a little bit of what I, what I say in the book, is that um, what she says is that basically there is no way to like effectively and scientifically write uh, quasi like or empirically represent Helena in modern writing because you know Goethe tried to do that, and for her it's kind of a disaster, right? Uh, because we've given up this kind of supernaturalism uh, that that she associates with the Marlowe version of, of the Faustus myth. So I do think that there is the sense that within kind of this the, the kind of Apollonian aesthetics, the modern Apollonian aesthetics of, of Victorian culture, that that is encoded within that a kind of normalization or naturalization of, of female subordination or um, this uninterest in exploring female subjectivity that it somehow doesn't rise to the level of, of the properly aesthetic or formal. Yeah, so I think that there is a consistent critique there in Lee's writing. Okay, thank you. Really yeah. thank you. Fraser, did you have a question? Can I just see your hand up? Um, yeah, why not? Um, Justin, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I, I um, su such a such a rich paper, and I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, uh, uh, I, I might I might be showing my ignorance here, but I I, um, I thought it was really interesting um, the the point you were making about um, uh, questions of race and uh, the way in which um, uh, patronly are, are re resisting that sort of hierarchical mm. um, idea of the aesthetic that. that Ruskin is sort of imposing, and um, I wondered. Um, I wondered if you if you had thoughts about um, the idealization of the of the male body in um, in Pater's work more broadly, because it's not something I've thought a great deal about. But I've I've always felt slightly uncomfortable that it seems to go back to a what seems to be a sort of proto white supremacist um, mm. Greek, Greek ideal. And I, I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. Yeah, that's 
really interesting, actually, because there is, um, right, there is this way of talking about Pater's homoeroticism, which isn't generally this kind of celebratory, um, anti-homophobic mode, which is all there. And um, I want to think that Pater is self-aware of the sort of the racialization encoded in that Apollonian ideal. And what I'm suspecting, which I'm, I'm this is part of a, of a larger project I'm working on, is that that kind of awareness of the racial element might be more self-conscious in his post-Renaissance writings rather than in like Winkelmann and, and the Renaissance writings themselves, which seem to be a little bit less closely attuned to issues of race, at least in my reading. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question from Frankie. Hi, yeah. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I was really sold by the idea of Lee's account of this uni um, inclusive universalism of primitive emotion. I think it's a particularly uh, good contrast to someone like Abby Varberg, who's also thinking through similar themes. But I was wondering how you thought that Lee accounts for the failure of certain artworks or artists to capture the beneficial aspect of those primitive emotions. I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly in relation to 15th century Italian art, which he tends to actually be quite critical of, which obviously mm -hmm. known as you know the early Italian primitives at that point, and so they're you know part of this kind of primitivizing discourse. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how yeah how Lee sees the production of art in relation to these this universalism rather than just the aesthetic appreciation of it. Right. You know, the, the question of artistic production is, is quite interesting. And um, again, I'm just thinking about, just be, I've been thinking about it a lot recently, the Faustus and Helena essay, right? Which has a lot to say not only on supernaturalism, of course, but also about sort of um, the notion of aesthetic beauty that kind of develops from the Renaissance onward, right? And the way in which she categorizes sort of the closer that artists become interested in beauty as the ideal of artistic representation rather than an attempt to capture um, kind of one incohate uh, quasi-supernatural experiences of the world, the extent to which that has two implications. One, the aggrandizing of the role of the artist in society, right? And the cultural importance of the artist, which is part and parcel with this increasing emphasis on the development of formal beauty in art, right? And I, I do think that there is a certain undertone there that this celebration of the role of the artist through the celebration of artistic formalism is tied in with this kind of white supremacism, with this patriarchy, with this misogyny as well. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got time for another question. Yeah, I think we have one question here. Someone has been raising their hand on video. Yes. Yeah, can I can I jump in quickly? Um, hi. First of all, thank you very much for a really interesting le lecture or or, or a paper rather. Um, I have a question uh, that somehow implicitly has been addressed already, and that is the notion mm -hmm. of race. Mm -hmm. And our I've noticed that the Victorian notion of race is not exactly what we are trying to understand or seem to understand by race. And it seems like we have a very inflexible or unflexible uh, word for a uh, concept of that uh, these days. And I'm saying that um, because uh, I've, I've read some interesting criticisms about uh, Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights, mm -hmm. and they have used a, um, a more fluid uh, concept of race. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. uh, to what extent you have considered or are considering maybe comparing the different concepts of race, not only in the, not between the 19th, 20th, 21st century, but between also the, uh, the players or the, or the, the, the mm -hmm. writers that you have mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah, mentioned. that's definitely, think, yeah, thank you. That's definitely something that I've, I've I was considering as I was composing um, this paper in terms of the kind of, the very kind of um, fluid sense that the word race has in the Victorian period, right? Which can refer to, something closer to nationality or something some, in some instance to something closer to what we think of as like a biological concept of race. Um, and how I sort of worked it through in this paper is I get the sense from the way that Ruskin 
is using the term race in uh, The Queen of the Air seems to be maybe not exactly the same, but very similar to 20th century biological notions of race, especially the associated with the association with certain kind of um, primit patronizing kind of primitivism mm -hmm. associate that he's associating with it. Uh, and then again, also when you think of, you know, Ruskin's writings in the wake of, of, of Governor Eyre, right? Um, I do think he's very much thinking of race in a way which is uh, quite parallel with, with modern notions of racism. And then the way in that plays out in the writings of Pater and Lee, who seem to be in direct dialogue with that definition of race from Queen of the Air. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think um, it's time for us to um, draw the evening to a close. Would you um, like to put your videos on and your audio and give Give just in a round of applause, that'd be really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure to have you speak for us.